Well, your father, uh, Gabor Mate, kind of became, not kind of, he became a global phenomenon. Yeah, for a so good I hear. reason. Yeah, for yeah. many good reasons. Yeah. Uh, and this latest book, uh, The Myth of Normal, uh, is just another one that kind of cemented the 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 reputation uh, of him. They call him the human whisperer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which is kind of funny. Um but true at the same time. And this book, The Myth of Normal, is co-written uh, with you. Yeah, my name's on the title, on, yeah. on, on, the, on, on the cover. So yeah. we're going to jump into it. But before we start doing it, uh, for, for the people who are not familiar with Gabor or with you, let's just give a little introduction about, sure. um, about who he actually is mm -hmm. and his story, which is also revealed here. And it's really not unknown. Yeah. But for many people who are into just introducing this uh, topic to them, uh, maybe it's, it's going to be probably of uh, big importance in, other, in, in order to understand the big picture uh, around the topic of trauma. Yeah. And then I would like to dedicate some time to uh, talk about you and your career because mm -hmm. it's a very interesting mix of things that yeah. you actually do. And now you're a published uh, author also. Uh, so yeah, where would be a good start uh, with, uh, with, with your father? Probably 1945, I guess. 44. 44. When yeah, 44 19, was when he was born. Exactly. So, uh, I mean, just keep in mind, I'll be telling this history as his son. So this yeah. is this is the this is a biased telling, but <laughs> but you know there are some facts of the matter. Um, yeah, he was born not very far from here. Uh, what Budapest is what two hours away? Um, it was three four hours. Three four yeah. hours. Okay. Yeah. So he was born uh, in January 44, um, which was not the ideal time to be born in this part of the world yeah. as a Jew. Especially in, in Hungary. In at Hungary. The at the time, yeah. Um, and the Germans were already, you know, I'm, 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 I should know the history in, in more specific detail than I do, but I do know that the Germans were making their incursion into, you know, toward Budapest from the outside of the country towards the center. Um, and the deportations were happening. So um, I'm not sure exactly when it was, but sometime that year, uh, my dad's grandparents were deported to Auschwitz. Um, his father, my grandfather, Andor, um, and now there's a Star Wars show named after him, obviously, Andor. Mm -hmm. Do you know that show, Andor? Is no, the, no, no. Disney, Disney Star Wars has, Dis uh, anyway. Oh, this that, is, that, that's uh, the, the lead character, yeah. The lead character, Andor, right. yeah. Oh, but, okay. Andor was my 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 uh, grandfather was away in a forced labor camp um, with the uh, the Hungarian army and I think I think a friend smuggled him in like hiding the fact that he was Jewish mm. um, and it was a dangerous time it was just a really dangerous time and they were living under terrible terrible conditions and the Jews were forced to move into a very small area of the of the city, you know, the Budapest ghetto. Um, and, you know, because my, gr my grandfather did get, I think, like a two-week leave to come home and see his son, but after that he didn't, my, my dad didn't see him again for another year. Mm. And my grandmother, uh, Judy, um, didn't have much news from him or they didn't have news of each other, so they really didn't know if the other was alive or dead. So it's just an extremely stressful, stressful time. And my dad tells the story of how um, his mother called the pediatrician a few days after he was born saying, can you come see us? Gabor is, won't stop, he won't stop crying. And the, the doctor said, of course I'll come, but I should tell you all my Jewish babies are crying. Mm. You know, and the point that my dad makes there is, you know, well, what do Jewish babies know of Nazis and genocides and world wars? They don't, they, they, what they feel is the stress of their parents, the emotional absence of their parents, which has nothing to do with a lack of love, anything but. It has to do with just people having limits, you know, and, and, and the emotional realities that people live in is what gets transmitted to the child, not the conscious intentions of the parents. And, you know, my grandmother was a hero mm -hmm. and she kept him alive by heroic means. At one point they managed to find refuge in a... I think it was a Swiss-operated 
I might be getting, maybe I'm getting this confused with Schindler's List. I, you know, yeah. I, I, I find myself more vague on the details than I really ought to be, but they, there was, it was a, a converted glass factory mm -hmm. and, but just overrun with families, you know, latrines in the court, no, no bathrooms, just very unsanitary. My dad had dysentery, um, you know, almost died. And at a certain point, not on a whim, but on a strong gut feeling, my grandmother, on the spur of the moment, I would say, handed him, and I think he was maybe eight or nine months at this point, handed him to a non-Jewish non woman on the street and begged her, please take my baby to these relatives who happened to be living in relatively safer circumstances. And because she had no faith that she herself was going to survive and she knew that he wouldn't. And this woman, you know, talk about another hero, you know, conveyed him safely to these relatives. And um, I think it was six weeks apart. Mm. Maybe it was fewer. I don't know. You'll you have to go back and read the book. I, again, I'm forgetting the details. But, you know, it was severe separation from his mother to save his life. So these were the circumstances of um, his birth. And meanwhile, you know, my grandmother got word that her parents had been exterminated in Auschwitz. Her sister had been, my, uh, my great aunt Marta had been deported uh, to Auschwitz with them, but she actually survived. Mm. Um, uh, but they didn't know that until afterwards when she came home in a Nazi guard uniform because that's the only clothes she could find after the camps were liberated. So it's just a very dramatic, horrific, um, adverse, stressful way to come into the world. Yeah. And that was his introduction to uh, planet Earth. Yeah, and the human race and the society. And the human race and the society and the realities of being a person, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and already experiencing the first detachment Yes. Yeah, which is going to be very important in understanding, you know, because what I love about this book is because it's uh, intertwined with a lot of personal stories and a yes. lot of testimonials and, you know, which gives it, you know, a more of a dramatic touch, which it gives it sort of a novelic type of feeling. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just, a, it's not just a, 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 a narrow specific, you know, book yeah. designed for, people in, within the uh, who has some kind of expertise or knowledge yeah certainly not within the area within the area of expertise mm -hmm. right so um, uh, uh, what how he ended up in Canada well the war ended in 1945 and his parents reunited mm. very happy to be alive they had another son my uncle Janos a couple of years later born into relatively happy circumstances. And he had a childhood growing up in Budapest. And when, the, but then, you know, first the Nazis, then the Soviets, Yeah, 1956, <laughs> the revolution, mm. he wakes up to the sound of tank thunder of the, of the red army coming in to crush the student uprising. And I think basically it was like, my grandparents looked at each other and it was like, nope, <laughs> you <laughs> know, like, having this again. not again, we're yeah. getting out of here. And they trudged out of there, you know, late one night in the rain, through the mud into into Austria. Mm -hmm. um, and there's many stories, you know, in a lot of Hungarian refugees from 1956 in Canada and the United States who all left in the same way around the same time. It's interesting. I, I, I keep meeting a lot of, you know, children of uh, of that Hungarian story. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the options were between. New York, Montreal, and Vancouver, or something like that, and they ended up on a they you know they landed at Halifax. They took a took a boat, and got on a cross Canada train, and didn't get off until they hit the Pacific Ocean, and they ended up in Vancouver. And um, and then they had another son in Vancouver, my uncle George, who goes by Mate, yeah. uh, because he's he's the he's the Canadian born Mate, you know, <laughs> yeah. Um, Mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, of course, when I was growing up, my dad was Gaber Mate. That's how Vancouverites, that's how Canadians said it, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's, you know, and then he met my mother in the late 60s um, at uh, the University of British Columbia, where she was a cartoonist 
and he was a political columnist, and she was assigned to draw his caricature. Yeah, during during the Yugoslavia, we had the Yugoslavian time. You know, the former republics. Uh, we all used to be one country called Yugoslavia. Yeah, especially at the time. I uh, remember. I, I you know I'm, I was born in seventy five. I remember this. Yeah. Things. So yeah, and um, and uh, during the. Uh, uh, during the Iron Curtain and during you know the Soviet era and stuff like that, yeah. so we had uh, a lot of refugees from Hungary and we were helping a lot of a lot of them to cross over. Yeah. At the time, because Yugoslavia and the President Tito at the time, they were like in this very specific political situation where they could afford it. We were behind the curtain, uh, sort of saying it because um, you know if how they like to say it, if communism was red, uh, Yugoslavian communism was kind of pink. <laughs> You know, so he was a dictator, but benev- benevolent one. Yes. You know, so but still a dictator, right? And um, and uh, he held his power uh, also by ver- various means. One of the means was this non-alignment agreement that he had with you know Middle Eastern and African countries. Yeah. That's basically my origin story because gotcha. my father came, you know, to study in, yeah. in, in, during, during the Yugoslavia in the 60s and he was the member of, you know, Flower Power 1968 generation, you know, the, the worldwide. Uh, quite opposite of the culture he's coming from. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so Gabor basically dedicated his whole life uh, dealing with uh, trauma in a way uh, and discovering the topic and the influence of trauma in his life many years later, right? But uh, in his professional career, he was, you know, dealing with um, with patients from various groups, from uh, palliative care to, I don't know, nurseries. Mm-hmm. So he was dealing with children. He was dealing with people uh, at the end of their life. Yep. And uh, over the course of many years during his practice, he noticed um, a commonalities, right? Yes. Yeah. Something that binds them all together. Yeah. Which is uh, the thing that you emphasize so much called trauma. Mm-hmm. And uh, before we go into trauma and the myth of Norman, why the book is called that. <laughs>
let's dive in. Um, the myth of normal. Uh, two things that we have to uh, dissect first, and you know, I'm not dissect, more of a uh, how would uh, not decompose, but more you know, deconstruct. Deconstruct is the word I'm looking for. Yeah, the thing that we have to deconstruct. I like is, decompose though. I like that image. <laughs> yeah, uh, deconstruct is what is normal. Mm -hmm. How do we perceive normal, and um, <laughs> how do we deconstruct it in sure. order to understand what this book is about? Well, that's the joke, isn't it? Because normal is what we don't perceive. Yeah. I mean, there are there are legitimate uses of the word normal, as we say in the introduction. If you're a doctor and you're trying to make sure a person's going to stay alive. You want to make sure that their blood temperature stays within normal range. If you're a doctor with a pregnant patient who's saying, I am having this complication, you say, oh, that's normal for your trimester, right? Yeah. So those are valid, basically just statistical But we can also call them the typical, word. maybe. You could say typical, typical yeah, right, right. Yeah. But the normal is the, is the word that is used in medical practice. But when we talk about normal in the sense of the myth of normal, it's that to which we, has become, we have become accustomed that isn't necessarily natural or healthy. But the nature of that is, you said, what do we perceive as normal? It's what we don't perceive. We tell the story or this, you know, this, we recount this, this beautiful little um, allegory that David Foster Wallace gave at a commencement speech about two fish who are swimming along one day, two young fish swimming along, having a nice time and they pass by an older fish, and the older fish says, good morning, boys, how's the water? And they keep swimming along, and they turn to each other, and one of them turns to the other, but a few minutes later says, what the fuck is water? <laughs> you know? <laughs> because they don't, they don't need to notice it, because they can just take it for granted. Well, so what is the water that we swim in that we don't even notice? And we're trying to draw people's attention to things that they're not even perceiving. Mm. Um, so, for instance... First of all, you have to, first, I mean, it starts with noticing it. And one of the ways you notice it, just like you were saying before, like make, creating that bridge from, I don't even know how I feel. Well, one thing is to just take a look around and say, how's that going for you? So in a personal's personal life, you say, well, how, how's that not knowing how you feel going for you? Well, I'm kind of depressed and I don't really know what I'm doing in my life. I'm kind of bored and I'm, you know, smoking a lot of pot and, you know, watching a lot of bad TV. Well, cause that's how that's going for you. That's a clue as to something. Yeah. That's not the secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord. On the societal level, how's, it, how's normal going for us? Well, we got skyrocketing cancer rates, autoimmune rates, suicidality is going way up, especially after all the COVID lockdowns, mental health diagnoses going, going off the charts, just unprecedented spikes in chronic health issues in the most wealthy nations in the world during the most health, I mean, the very first line of the book, which I, um, you know, I will, I will take personal credit for having yeah. written this sentence. In the most health-obsessed society in human history, all is not well. Mm. Yeah. How can that be? Well, something is off, right? So there's something about what we've become accustomed to or acculturated to, we might say, given that it's a question mm. of culture, that isn't doing us any favors on the health level. But because our ideology says, no, this is how it's supposed to be, then we're left to cope with that. So then what we get, what becomes normal is, well, okay, now we're going to fight cancer. We're going to do marathons for cancer and marathons for multiple sclerosis. I'm not trying to denigrate those things. But we act as if they're sort of antagonistic intruders who have landed from outer space who are messing up our nice normal. And we just need to like kill the aliens or solve the mystery and we can go back to being normal. But what if these diseases or at least their prevalence, their flourishing, their metastasizing, you might say, on us, are an expression of how we live, yeah. not an interruption of how we live, both on the collective and the individual level. So there's all kinds of evidence in the book, and I'm, now I'm jumping a little bit ahead, that, and you know, my dad's been cataloging, excuse me, cataloging this science, which is not his own original research, but he's been synthesizing it ever since his book, When the Body Says No, 20 years ago, that much of chronic illness is an expression of, or it's potentiated by, or it predisposes people to, um, sorry, it's predisposed by certain fixed normalized personality traits mm -hmm. that are expressions of people being cut off from themselves, which itself is an expression of trauma. So people who suppress their anger, yeah, people who can't say no, people who have to rigidly identify with their role and always do their duty and never express themselves 
you know, on that never jump, never take the leap of faith bridge, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. there are physical consequences and, or there are emotional and psychological consequences. And of course, here's another thing that gets normalized. The Western medical ideology, really a superstition that mind and body are separate. They ain't. Yeah. <laughs> they can't be separated. They're the same. They're not even, they're not even connected because the same thing can't be connected to itself. It's just two sides of the same coin. Yeah. So all of these things, I'm starting to like shade in that picture that you're asking about of what, what is normal. What's, there's so many things that have become normalized that res, that are, we can work our way backwards from how it's going to say, well, why is it that way? And maybe there's a, maybe there's a simpler reason why our health is going the way it's going than that we have to solve this pandemic and this disease and this mental health crisis and this separate, uh, cancer of this body part. Maybe it's all connected. Yeah. Sort of a holistic, you know, approach to, 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 to things. I just want to A holistic approach, but also a, a good detective approach too. I yeah. mean, Sherlock Holmes would always want to have the simplest, most elegant explanation. Yeah. Yeah. And how, uh, it doesn't matter how much, how improbable, you know, if it's the only one the left it is, only is, seems improbable because the, we're looking at it in a yeah. in, in, in a way that ha, um, that we become used that to this Eric from uh, the Saint Society quote is perfect for the book yeah, from, so, yeah. so I just want to read it uh, I don't want to paraphrase it right the fact that millions of people share the same vices does not make these vices virtues mm -hmm. the fact that they share so many errors does not make the errors to be truth and the fact that millions of people share the same forms of mental pathology does not make these people sane. It's so it's so nice. It's so well put. Yeah. Uh, it's all well put. And also uh, the 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 myth of normal trauma, illness, and healing in a toxic culture. Yeah. So there's another thing that we have to put in the mix. Yes. It's a toxic culture. Yes. And regarding the the fact the the, the one of the most surprising. What I love about the book also is uh, it sort of it doesn't shy away from its sources. No, uh, it sort of sort of you know you you can use it also as an aggregate of various different um, authors uh, and 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 people who had a lot of experience in in practice. All all of them put together in yeah. a very well. You know, the, the book is a conference. Uh, it, it's like a, it's a clearing. It's like it's like my dad. I mean, I think he interviewed 250 people. He yeah. gathered 25,000 articles. It's a crazy amount How of research. How big was the research, the research actually? Ten, 10 years, I think literally 25,000 articles. That's a lot. You, know, you had to go through all of them? I didn't. <laughs> yeah. No, I came aboard relatively late in the process, of, yeah. you know, with four years to go. My job was to make sure the damn thing got written. Yeah. And that it was readable. Yeah, <laughs> but 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 that that's but, not a, that's no easy feat. No, not with this much material. I mean, my dad's a good writer, but we wanted this book to to have a little bit of um, a bit more. I mean, we wanted this to be for the broadest possible audience, yeah. both geographically and culturally speaking. Yeah, yeah. No matter what your politics are, yeah. no matter what your education level is, and I tried to bring in um, just a bit more lightness a bit more of a contemporary feel you know things yeah. like that but the work the the research incredible amount of work went into yeah. this on his part one of the most uh the one of the hardest one to take for me of all those uh, uh um, from all those i uh, i lost the word um examples right uh was the 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 connection between agreeable people and als mm. it's like that once that once I, I've read that, I was like, "That's not possible." Well, but, especially given the study that we cited, where where nurses basically were asked to predict based on just meeting patients yeah. or reading their personality profiles, which of them would get ALS or which would test positive for it, and their success rate was something like eighty five percent. And they would say, this person can't have ALS, they're not nice enough. <laughs> and when we say nice, we don't mean kind. We don't mean, we don't mean benevolent or, or, or good-hearted. We mean excessively uh, to a self-abnegating degree, always putting other people's needs first, suppressing one's own no, suppressing one's own anger. That kind of compulsive niceness mm -hmm. that you can just feel with somebody which has a kind of tension underneath it. Why is there a tension? Because they're stuffing down their own feelings and they don't, and that's the thing on the individual level, they've completely normalized it for themselves. Yeah. So they don't even know they're doing it, which is, and there's a reason for that because those coping patterns come from childhood as a way to survive trauma traumatizing situations. It's, if we, 
gather from our childhood environment that if I'm angry, mommy and daddy won't be okay or they won't love me or I won't get the love I need. Well, it's not enough for me to say, well, okay, maybe me just consciously hide it from them every time they're on. No, much, much better if my brain says, okay, let's forget how to be angry. Yeah. Let's stuff it away. Let's normalize being nice and just always being agreeable. And if you think about it for one second, uh, my dad always makes this analogy. I think it's, it's pretty self-evident. The immune system and the, and the anger system, the emotional system have exactly the same purpose, which is to welcome in good stuff and keep out the bad stuff. Yeah. But if you teach, if, if you, if you enforce on your emotional system, don't, don't be angry. It means that you'd never get to say no, which means you have no say over what's coming in and what's going out. And since these systems are not only connected, but in fact, unitary, you're messing with the immune system and what are, what is autoimmune disease? Literally, it's the immune system attacking itself, getting confused about what's good for it, what's bad for it. So yeah, it's, it's crazy. Mm. Uh, not crazy in the sense of insane, but it's, it's, it, it, it seems outlandish when you first, yeah. when you first read about it, but that's just one data point among so many that we try to bring in to show that all these things are connected. And of course, Western medicine doesn't want to see those connections. That was an eye-opener thing for me also when talking about trauma here because, you know, on one hand, you know, the, 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 the drawbacks, you know, the, the coping mechanisms that takes you to, you know, illnesses, to, you know, depression, to mm -hmm. addiction, it's, it's something somewhat expected, mm -hmm. you know, but once you start talking about 
the trauma in uh, popular culture, in uh, politics, in, with successful people, the way we celebrate the coping mechanisms from early childhood traumas, that's amazing one. And also the, the amazing one that I've kind of recognized myself in it was, you know, when trauma happens to you and then you don't let it uh, express itself in any way possible, you know, so you feel like it hasn't touched you in a way. And uh, therefore, you learn how to not be touched by trauma in the future. And you say, oh, it doesn't affect me. But the fact that it doesn't affect you is the way it affected you. That's exactly right. <laughs> that was kind of you know conundrum that I, I was I was I was flabbergasted when I you know when I when I heard that I, and then I realized you know projected to my own life and I was like, God damn, that's yeah. so true. Well, it be, and 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 that requires a reconfiguration of our understanding of the word trauma, which we sort of skipped over, but yeah. it's a, it's very crucial because trauma we usually think of trauma as bad events, you know. So you have a you're like Serb and Somali, so I could, yeah. you know, I could, I could assume that there's been big T traumatic events in your family history. Your your yeah. people have seen some shit. A lot of, yeah, you know, and maybe you have yourself. Uh, my father went through a capital T trauma. I went through a capital T trauma when, when when my dad would yell at me, like scream at me, like I'm a crazy person, and hit me across the face once, you know, in front of the entire family. That's a big T trauma, I'd say. You know, it's not a genocide, but it's yeah. To a child, it's 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 terrifying. You know, the worst thing that happens to you is the worst thing that happens to you. That's exactly right. Yeah, exactly. Um, but that's not the definition of trauma. That is that is an event that can potentiate trauma. A trauma is a wound, not an event. So trauma is the effect that lasts. So in American football, the trauma is not the illegal hit to the head; it's the concussion, because mm. that's what lasts. So it's what happens inside of you as a result of what happens to you. Well. In the light of that, there's more than one way to wound somebody. You can wound them by having some something bad that shouldn't have happened happen. You can also wound them by something something good that needed to happen or should have happened not happen. And one of the good things, again, now we're getting back to the human needs from your previous question, one of the not just good but mandatory things that we need in order to be ourselves is to feel all of our emotions. But what if I didn't learn that I could? What if I learned, in fact, that it was dangerous to feel all my emotions? Because the minute I start feeling angry, daddy flips out or mommy shuts off emotionally. Or in my case, I think there were aspects of my joy that were unacceptable to my parents. They were too much. Ex you know, the ways that I would seek for approval and attention. Mm. And when it was coming from my anxiety, uh, that was also, I experienced it as rejected or rebuffed, let's say. Well, so now the good thing that needed to happen, which is the I needed the world I was born into to say, Daniel, welcome. All of you is welcome. And you'll sort out for yourself later which parts you want to foreground and, and, yeah, and, yeah. And, 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 and put on the back burner. You know? But for now, as a, as a little toddler, you know, have at it. And we will guide your behavior so that you're not putting your hands on hot coals and running out into the street. It's not like there's no boundaries. But in terms of acceptability, in terms of welcome, you are welcome just as you are. We need that. But if that doesn't happen, and again, it doesn't need you don't need a father slapping you across the face or a world war to get the message, oh, mommy and daddy love me, but they but that kind of turns off when I get like this. Okay, well, I'm not gonna go there. Mm -hmm. Okay, well now I've what's the best way I can cope with that? I'm gonna get cut off from that. I'm not gonna let it affect me. When things affect me, when I show that things affect me, that's when the hammer really comes down. So I'm just not going to let things affect me. So now it, now it doesn't affect me. But exactly as you said, that is exactly where it affected me. It's like, like a car accident. It's not an impact. It's about the injury that impact creates That's within right. your body that stays. You know, That's the, right. the accident is what happened at that precise moment. That's right. The injury is what you carry with yourself over time, right? right. So the trauma is actually that. The, 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 the way your body reacted in the moment of a traumatic experience. And there's also a couple of things that uh, I think we need to clear up when it comes to trauma and we talk about analogies. The one analogy I really liked in the book is uh, open wound and scar tissue. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So when you sustain a wound, um, let see if I can rem remember this one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Because it is a good one. That you know, if the wound remains open, uh, it'll be exquisitely sensitive 
to the touch, and anytime you get near it, you know, and it's also very likely to become infected if it stays open, right? Yeah. Um, you'd have to keep everything away from it, and you'd constantly have to be changing the bandage and all that kind of stuff. It takes a lot of upkeep, and the body wants to heal up that heal that wound. The other thing, the other option, if it's a, if it's a deep enough cut, is that you know the better option really is to create scar tissue. A scar seals the wound, and it replaces it with a layer of dead skin, basically, which can't feel, and it's numb, and nothing new can grow there. Well, that's preferable than having an open sore, but it has a cost, and many of our, if we want to know where our traumas are, it leads back to what you were talking about, that thing, I, I, I'm not connected to myself. Well, that very spot of not being connected to yourself, what if that's scar tissue? Yeah, That's that numb spot, that dead spot. So it could be in the world of your um, sex drive. It could be in the world of your uh, social life. It could be in the world of your self-confidence. It could be in the world of your um, self esteem or trust in your in your your gut feelings or your ideas um it could be in the realm of you know this emotion or that emotion that you're not comfortable feeling or don't even think you have so people say i never get angry yeah. well you weren't born that way <laughs> <laughs> so what happened to it it's the case of the dis it's the case of the the disappearing mm. core emotion yeah none of us are born disconnected from any part of ourselves we make these compromises throughout life. Yeah. Um, and they, and those then end up as personality traits we might think of as strengths, just like Hillary Clinton and her whole campaign team thought of her resilience, quote unquote, as a strength, when in fact it was a, um, it may be a strength, but it was built on top of a terrible wound, a terrible scar, which is to say, never trust anybody. You are all alone. Um, no one is going to be here for you. The world is a, a cold, unforgiving place. The best thing you can do is to beat them at their own game. Yeah, and that's the way we create narratives that we yeah. start believing in them, and yeah. those narratives become our real, our reality. And the, and those are our ideologies. And those are our our ideologies, and then they truly become reality because the way we perceive the world that we're living in is the way the world is in our realities. It's it you know it it. it who's that who said that we don't see the world as it is? We see the world as we are. Hmm. Who's that? I don't know. Oh, can't remember. But I like the quote. Yeah. 